Hi, I'm the History Guy. I love history, and if you love history too, this is the channel for you. The U.S. has five branches to its military, and most Americans are familiar with the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, and the Coast Guard. But the U.S. has seven uniformed services, and it's those other two uniformed services with which Americans are not nearly as familiar. One of those is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Commission Corps, which was derived from the U.S. Survey of the Coast and was the subject of another episode of the History Guy. But the seventh service is, in many ways, maybe the, the, the least understood, despite the fact that it has a rich history, has made enormous contributions to the nation and to the world world and continues to play vital functions today. The history of the Commission Corps of the U.S. Public Health Service is history that deserves to be remembered. On July 16, 1789, U.S. President John Adams signed a bill entitled An Act for the Relief of Sick and Disabled Seamen to, as Adams described, preserve the general health and the interests of safety and the revenue. In brief, the Act used the Congress's power to regulate commerce to authorize the deduction of 20 cents per month from the wages of seamen for the sole purpose of funding medical care for sick and disabled seamen, as well as building additional hospitals for the treatment of those seamen. Under the bill, the President was given authority to appoint directors to each port, and excess funds would be saved until they accumulated enough to build federally operated hospitals. The hospitals were called Marine Hospitals, with the first established in Virginia in 1801, and the first specifically built for the purpose in Boston in 1803, and were owned and operated by the federal government. Originally, the hospitals were all in East Coast ports, but eventually they were also built along the Gulf Coast, inland waterways, and as the nation expanded on the West Coast. The directors and staff of the hospitals were the predecessors of today's Commission Corps. The early hospitals were underfunded, and the location of hospitals and hiring of staff was heavily influenced by politics. During the Civil War, both Federal and Confederate troops occupied the various hospitals, and many fell out of service. By the end of the war, the service was struggling, and an 1869 study by the Treasury Department determined that it needed reform. And so, in 1870, the system was reorganized as the Marine Hospital Service, and a position to oversee the service, entitled the Supervising Surgeon, was created. The first supervising surgeon, Civil War veteran John Maynard Woodworth, transformed the nature of the medical staff. He instituted examinations for applicants, and medical staff were appointed to the general service rather than a specific hospital. This reduced political influence and professionalized the service, creating a cadre who would be assigned and moved as needed to the various marine hospitals. Important also was that he organized the service along military lines, and for the first time, the medical staff were given uniforms. More importantly, Woodward saw an expanded role for the service beyond the care of merchant seamen, eventually getting, for example, the authority for the service to enforce quarantine and publishing journals. In that way, the service became more broadly involved in public health. As a result of these expanded responsibilities, the title of supervising surgeon was changed in 1873 to something that is much more familiar today. It became the supervising Surgeon General. Woodworth also provided the service with its distinctive seal, featuring a fouled anchor representing the merchant seaman under the surface of care, and the Catechism Mercury, which fittingly represents both medicine and commerce. Woodworth remained in the position as the nation's first Surgeon General until his death in 1879. The service's role again expanded in the area of public health under Woodworth's successor, John B. Hamilton. Because of its position at U.S. ports of entry in close relationship with the Revenue Cutter Service, the predecessor to the U.S. Coast Guard, the MHS was able to effectively manage a quarantine, and the service played an important role in controlling an epidemic of yellow fever in 1878 and of Asiatic cholera in 1892. It was in this era that, in 1877, an officer of the Marine Hospital Service established a hygienic laboratory to apply the new science of bacteriology to the study of infectious disease. The laboratory, under pioneering MHS physician John Kenyon, was the nation's first federal bacteriology laboratory. In 1930, the laboratory was renamed the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and today is the primary agency of the United States government responsible for biomedical and public health research, with an annual budget of $37 billion. As the role of the service expanded, and as the nation saw mass immigration and growth, the service was given responsibility over the medical inspection of arriving immigrants, helping to prevent the entry of disease into the country. In 1889, an act of Congress officially recognized the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps as the uniform component of the Marine Hospital Service. And in 1912, the name of the Public Health and Marine Hospital Service was shortened to the Public Health Service, which has evolved over time to include a number of roles in addition to the duties of the Commission Corps. When yellow fever struck troops during the Spanish-American War, officers of the Commission Corps were responsible for preventing an outbreak in the U.S. brought back by returning troops. As a result of that service, Congress changed the law so that the Corps could be militarized and considered to be a branch of the armed forces in time of war or emergency by an act of Congress or executive order of the President. 
President Wilson did so at the outset of the First World War, and many of their professionals were detailed to the Army and the Navy. The conditions of the war and army camps was a breeding ground for infectious disease, and the Corps had its hands full already when one of the worst outbreaks in human history, the influenza pandemic of 1918, struck. The Corps expanded greatly during the pandemic, which eventually killed nearly a half million Americans. The Corps expanded again during the Second World War, with officers serving in all branches. Eight members of the Corps lost their lives in the conflict. In addition to providing medical support for the services, members of the Corps played central roles managing infectious diseases among the world's refugees. It was also during the war that, to address the nation's critical shortage of nurses, a division of nurse education was added to the public health service and answerable to the Surgeon General in a program known as the Cadet Nurse Corps. The wartime program, which funded nursing education, was credited with helping to standardize nurse training in the United States and preventing the collapse of civilian nursing care as so many nurses entered the military service. In 1946, another Second World War program, intended to control malaria in war areas, was institutionalized under the Public Health Service as the Communicable Disease Center. Today, that organization is known as the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But the Corps faced new challenges. In 1960s, as Congress expanded social programs, the Public Health Service was put under the control of the Assistant Secretary for Health. And for the first time in history, the Surgeon General was no longer in charge of the entire Public Health Service. And then in 1981, Congress changed the entitlement for health care for merchant seamen. And the remaining Marine hospitals, the reason the Corps was founded, were closed. But with the changes, the role of the Surgeon General became a high-profile role as the nation's advocate for public health. In 1964, Surgeon General Luther Terry unveiled a groundbreaking report called Smoking and Health, Report of the Advisory Committee of the Surgeon General of the Public Health Service. This was the first significant report to lay out the effects of tobacco and smoking, and it forever changed the public's understanding of both tobacco use and the U.S. Surgeon General. The profile of the position rose even further under Surgeon General C. Everett Koop in the 1980s, whose championing of AIDS research, understanding, and prevention, opposition to smoking, and advocacy for the rights of disabled children made him perhaps the most well-known Surgeon General in history. While the Corps continues its vital public health role serving underserved populations and engaging in research and health advocacy, perhaps its most high-profile role is in disaster relief. Teams called Rapid Deployment Forces work to serve the medical needs of people displaced by storms, earthquakes, and other disasters, including deploying over a thousand officers to New York City in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. Officers of the Corps are often deployed even before a storm strikes, helping to evacuate critical patients before the storm comes, and then placing themselves in danger, riding out the storm so that they can respond immediately in the storm's aftermath. Their role encompasses the world, and today officers of the Corps help provide humanitarian aid and relief through the Pacific Partnership, which started as a response to the devastating 2004 Indonesian earthquake and tsunami, and then transformed into an annual deployment designed to foster regional cooperation and includes providing humanitarian, medical, dental, and engineering assistance to nations of the Pacific. And the similar Operation Continuing Promise, which provides medical, dental, and veterinary aid to people in Latin America. Today, the National Public Health Service Commission Corps consists of more than 6,700 serving officers and has expanded to include professionals from 11 different professional categories and more than 50 allied health specialties, including nurses, scientists, social workers, optometrists, and veterinarians. They support health services for all seven uniform services, as well as the federal, state, and local agencies in need. The Corps entirely consists of officers who wear uniforms of the United States Navy or Coast Guard with health service insignia. Officers of the Public Health Service Commission Corps served with distinction in the Spanish-American War, both world wars, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. They've deployed dozens of times for emergencies, natural disasters like hurricanes and tsunamis and earthquakes and terrorist events. They are the force that protects the nation from outbreaks of infectious disease, and members of the Corps played critical roles in medical breakthroughs for everything from smallpox and yellow fever to malaria and polio, and the Public Health Service Commission Corps provides critical medical care for underserved populations in the United States and throughout the world. They are our nation's public health heroes, and they have a long and underappreciated history that goes back more than 200 years. It is a history that deserves to be remembered. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series of short snippets of forgotten history about 10 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button, which is there on your left. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. And if you'd like more snippets of forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.